That is definitely the big question is how can we treat these people but not with other opioids good because uh, because the other opioids we're using now themselves they are addictive so that's not really the best solution but it's what we have um, and that's why like a lot of scientists researchers are looking at ways that they can um, treat the opioid use disorder or and in, in, in a way that that doesn't involve other opioids. You're listening to The Recovered Life Show, the show that helps people in recovery live their best recovered lives. And here is your host, Damon Frank. Welcome back to The Recovered Life Show. I'm pleased to be joined today by Lubin Doval. Lubin is a molecular biologist, opioid pharmacologist, and PhD candidate at the University of Rochester. His current work focuses on developing a therapeutic approach to treat opioid addiction. Welcome to the show, Lubin. Uh, thank you, Damon. Pleasure to be with you today. Great to be speaking with you today. You know, I wanted to do this show because a lot of people have a misconception about opioid addiction, and you are the expert on this, being a PhD candidate and researcher and scientist. Um, and I guess my first question, just for people who might not be familiar with opioids, what drugs are considered opioids? Well, opioids are uh, originally like from the uh, poppy seed, um, opium. Um, so as of now, the classification has uh, morphine and um, even uh, cocaine. And also there are some new drugs as uh, fentanyl. Um, that these kind of drugs are considered opioids in general. Got it. Uh, and fentanyl has been in the news a lot as being something that 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 is really killing a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, obviously an important conversation. What treatments are available now for opioid addiction? Now, the the best treatments really available are like what they call some other opioids that people use. And um, there are generally three classes of opioids. Um, drugs in general, they are generally um, what they call agonist, full agonist, partial agonist, or even antagonist. The agonist or full agonist would be, for example, drugs that when they act to the receptor, they have a full effect on the receptor activation. And morphine would be one of these drugs. And then you have the partial agonist as a buprenorphine, and you have antagonists like naloxone. Um, so for treatments right now, we use uh, methadone, which is a, a full agonist at the receptor. But the difference between methadone and morphine is that when you get high of methadone, it's not, I guess, as high as you get uh, from morphine. So the peaks don't, like the, the high and lows, the difference between the high and lows are lower between the differences um, that you get when you are on morphine. So because of that, people use it. So you're still on opioid but it's not as bad as being on morphine. And the next choice is buprenorphine as a partial antagonist, I mean, partial agonist. So the it's even lower than methadone. Yeah. And um, people go like, can go a while using buprenorphine and they don't, so they don't get to withdrawal. They still get some sort of, um, some sort of like high from the drug, but they can actually live the normal lives like every day as long as they go and take um, the buprenorphine dose as they should. You know, I know, uh, you know, many of the people that follow the show are people who are in recovery. So they are sober. And, you know, there's always a big controversy of using a drug to treat a drug if you're sober, right? So are there other ways that you're dealing with now to taper people off of op opioids where they wouldn't be on opioids at all? Yeah, so they want to get sober? That is definitely the big question is how can we treat these people but not with other opioids good? Because uh, because the other opioids we're using now themselves, they are addictive. So that's not really the best solution, but it's what we have. Um, and that's why like a lot of scientists, researchers, are looking at ways that they can um, treat the opioid use disorder or and and in a way that that doesn't involve other opioids and there are yeah. different 
um, different uh, researchers. And but for my work, I'm looking at a gene called FGF21, fibroblast growth factor 21. Mm. So it's a gene that that's part of that everyone has this gene already. And um, so it, this gene, generally the uh, class, or the category of this gene, the growth factors in general, they help with growth. They help with like wound healing. They help mm. with metabolism. But this gene in particular, the uh, FGF21 has been found to decrease the preference for sweet and alcohol in mice and monkeys. And so that kind of caught our attention because sweet and alcohol, although they act differently compared to the opioids, they act on the same pathway, the reward pathway. And so Got that's it. how we started to look at how FGF21 could affect opioid, um, the, the opioid beha endos behaviors, what is physiological. So, and that's like the new, I think the new school right now, that's what people are looking at, uh, new pathways and also new therapeutics that don't involve other opioids. And so what's the hope? What would be the response if if you were able to tap into what you're, what you're talking about? Would that, would that allow people a quicker recovery um, from opioid addiction? So there's definitely a long way to go, but the hope is that um, with the FGF21, if that was proven to be a good therapeutic against the um, opioid, then the way you could get it is like, because um, it would decrease the preference for, um, for the drug, for morphine, for example, then you would have a lower chance of going after morphine and having more of the drug. And also it could help when you go to a withdrawal decreases to help to decrease the different um, withdrawal symptoms like headache, um, muscle ache, spasms, and like um, people like having like cannot do it, doing anything um, else, just like sitting down in misery, in misery. And if it can help you uh, with the withdrawal symptoms, then you would be, um, you would have an opportunity to create the uh, um, drug and not having to deal with all these um, side effects. Yeah, you know, Lubin, I, w what's interesting about this is, I, you know, I never personally had an opioid addiction, but uh, in recovery, I've worked with people who have had opioid addictions. And this seems to be different in the recovery from other addictions, right? Yeah. Other drug addictions. And I know we had spoken on the phone about, you know, the afterlife of opioids in your system. Yeah. What, what are some of the common problems that people encounter trying to withdraw from opioids that might be a little different from withdrawing from alcohol or another type of drug? I think one of the biggest factors um, has to do with the environment and also how people perceive opioid addiction. Mm -hmm. um, so like a lot of times, like, you know, people don't really even want to talk about opioid addiction. It's it's just such taboo. And now think, thankfully um, more people are kind of classifying the addiction as a disease uh, because it is a disease. Um, but, you know, like if you are in an environment, you can't even express how you feel. You can't even have a normal support group. You can't have an environment where you feel uh, safe enough to say like, hey, I'm in the need for opioid, help me not get to that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a big part of it. And the second one I, I would say is the way the drug affects you because uh, when, because when you become addictive to, um, addicted to um, opioids in general, they change the way your brain works. So um, the, uh, physiologically, your like neurons are affected. And a lot of times, even after you're done taking the drug, the changes last. And that is a big factor. Do those changes ever go away? Let's say somebody was ad addicted to opioids for years. How long does that take to get full recovery or can you get full recovery from that? We don't know yet if you can get uh, full recovery. And that's the biggest problem because um, the changes are so deep in the neural circuit. Um, you really can't tell even after 10, 20 years if you go back. And that's why people who were once addicted to um, drugs in general, but um, opioids, they always have a higher chance of going back.
Yeah, we were talking about relapse and opioids, yeah. which tends to be a very common thing. And so what you're saying is that these neuropathways are kind of burned in when you use those. So yeah. I assume then opening up new neuropathways uh, to how you deal with pain, emotions, things like that would be helpful. Yeah, definitely. What do you think the future of medical treatment will be for opioid addiction? I think um, definitely novel therapeutics, uh, hopefully soon enough, <laughs> um, that will not have to do with um, other opioids. I mean, it's it's fantastic that you know now we can have buprenorphine or suboxone, and people can actually go to work, go have time, spend time with their family while dealing with the um, addiction or opioid use disorder. But uh, a long time ago, that wasn't possible. Um, so that's that's very good, but it, the chance of relapse is so high now. Um, so we definitely have to start thinking about better way of treating patients. And because a lot of people go into re, um, relapse. And the second thing, we'll, hopefully we will have other um, other treatments like um, gene therapies, for example, or even use like other gene like the uh, gene I'm looking at, uh, FGF21, as a treatment for opioid use yeah. disorder. Now, I know as a scientist, you know, you're looking at, you know, medical cures, but you, you discussed about, you know, having a community around you and having support and things like that. Ha have, has any of your research uh, looked at the effect of that or spiritual uh, work or, uh, you know, work with community and being around a, a, a strong support system? I personally haven't looked at that, but I've um, read or listened to other people who've um, done work in this area that um, it's so much better when you have a community around you because you have people who can help you yeah. get past certain things alone you wouldn't be able to. And yeah. that's why a lot of, and to begin with, a lot of people um, going to um, drug dis uh, use disorders it usually has to do with certain problems, certain things they dealt with, some some sort of trauma, and you know it's so it's beneficial to have a group of people you can talk to, you can get past that. Absolutely, uh, Lubin Doval, thank you so much. Where can they find out about you? Where can they find out more about you and your work? Well, I work at uh, University of Rochester um, right now, the Department of Pharmacology. Um, but the best way to connect with me is on um, Instagram. It's Loop the Scientist, L O U B the Scientist, and um, on Twitter, Loop and Doval. And yeah, I'm always open to talk and chat about um, science or other topics. Thank you so much. And we're going to definitely put all of your contact information in the show notes so people can get in touch with you. Lubin, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Keep the conversation going. Join Recovered Life, a community of like-minded people who are looking to live their best recovered lives. Membership is free, and you can apply at recoveredlife.us.